Psalm 81 and you'll see the page numbers up here. Sing for joy to the God our strength. Shout aloud to the God of Jacob. Begin the music. Strike the tambourine. Play the melodious harp and lyre. Sound the ram's horn at the new moon. And when the moon is full on the day of our feast, this is a decree for Israel, an ordinance of the God of Jacob. He established it as a statute statute for Joseph when he went out against Egypt, where we heard a language we did not understand. He says, I removed the burden from their shoulders. Their hands were set free from the basket. In your distress you called and I rescued you. I answered you out of a thundercloud. I tested you at the waters of Meribah. Hear, O my people, and I will warn you, If you would but listen to me, O Israel, you shall have no foreign god among you. You shall not bow down to an alien god. I am the Lord your God, who brought you up out of Egypt. Open wide your mouth and I will fill it. But my people would not listen to me. Israel would not submit to me. So I gave them over to their stubborn hearts, to follow their own devices. If my people would but listen to me, if Israel would follow my ways, how quickly would I subdue their enemies and turn my hand against their foes. Those who hate the Lord would cringe before him and their punishment would last forever. But you would be fed with the finest of wheat, with honey from the rock I would satisfy you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you hungry and needing to be fed, thirsty and needing water from the living rock who is Jesus. Help us to open wide our mouths that you may fill us with good things this day for an encouragement and the strengthening of our faith. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Sing for joy to God our strength. Shout aloud to the God of Jacob. Begin the music. Strike the tambourine. Play the melodious harp and lyre. Welcome to the New Moon Festival. Probably it's the season of Passover. And you can hear the ram's horn being blown in verse 3, signalling for all the people to gather together before the Lord Almighty. And now it's time for the music to begin. So in verse 2, the psalmist asks for the tempo. Strike the tambourine, he says. He's asking actually for the drummer to give the beat so the musicians can come in together. A one, a two, a one, two, three, four. Give the beat. Give the beat. It's a scene of readiness for joyful worship. And now the singers are singing and the dancers are dancing and the musicians are playing their instruments with gusto because it's a beautiful day for singing joyful songs to God our strength. And you might think that everybody would be joining in. But the truth is there's at least one person today who isn't sharing in the joy. In fact, his heart is deeply troubled And his thoughts are filled with an inner conflict. How can I lead these people when my own heart is so sad? How can I sing songs of gladness when I feel so grieved by the abject spiritual poverty of our church and nation? That's how this worship leader is feeling. He's crying on the inside because he knows that his own people are living in denial. And the real reason why their lives are so hard is because they have rejected the Lord and they've not been listening to him at all. I mean, sure, they come and praise him with their lips, 
But in their hearts, they want none of him. Listen to what God says in verse 11. My people would not listen to me. Israel would not submit to me. Or in fact, literally it says they would have none of me. They love me not. They will not have me as their God. And yet here they are singing praises, gathering in his name, while the psalmist is crying on the inside. This psalm is not as it first appears. This psalm is another song of lament, another song of tears. And that totally changes the complexion of verse 1, doesn't it? It actually makes it much more like Psalm 137 in its underlying tone. You know that famous psalm? By the waters of Babylon we sat down and wept when we remembered Zion. There on the poplar trees we hung our harps, for there the captors asked us for songs. Our tormentors demanded songs of joy. They said, sing us one of the songs of Zion. They were mocking them as they wept. Psalm 81 is another psalm of lament. Despite the joyful opening lines, it was written to capture the paradox of being a believer in a time of unbelief, among a people of unbelief just like is happening in Australia today. So, spare a thought for the poor worship leader who's feeling discouraged. The truth is it can be hard to sing songs of joy. I don't know if you ever have that experience at Christmas. You know, come and all the decorations are out, but for whatever reason, for you, Christmas is not a time of joy and you come and you sing the carols, but you're crying on the inside. Well, that's what's happening here The truth is it can be hard to sing songs of joy. And yet sometimes, as a leader, you have to set aside your own feelings and do your duty. You have to lead the people. And you may may feel like crying. You may feel like dying. The things that have been going on in your life, in other matters that aren't before the congregation as a whole. And you must do your duty. And you must lead the congregation, lead the church in singing praises to God. And it can be really hard being in upfront ministry. And you may have no idea what's really going on. So what we have here is a surprisingly complex interplay of emotions. Sing to the Lord. Yes, sing. This is my first point for today. Sing for joy to God our strength even when it's hard. For music can minister powerfully to the soul. So look again at verse 1. Sing for joy to God our strength. Shout aloud to the God of Jacob. Begin the music, strike the tambourine, play the melodious harp and lyre. I may be feeling down, but I will not stop praising my God. I may be feeling discouraged, but I will look to God our strength. I will wait upon him to save us again and he will restore our joy. I will therefore strengthen the hand of God's people by encouraging them and encouraging you, even in godless times, no matter what's happening in your life, I will encourage you to sing for joy to God our strength because that is the only person who has the hope that we need. You see, this is one of the great reasons why you need to come to church. Don't be persuaded by this false idea that you can be a Christian and not part of the fellowship of God's people. That's not true. Your local church is your spiritual home. It is God's people meeting together in God's place under God's rule and blessing. So you need your church and your church needs you. The Christian life is not meant to be lived alone and there is safety in numbers. There is encouragement of faith when we gather together. And that's why verse 1 begins in the plural. I wish it had been written slightly differently. It literally says, let us sing. 
It speaks to the whole family of God and it gives a direction. Let us sing for joy to God our strength. Let us shout aloud to the God of Jacob. It speaks to all of us. And notice in verse 1, God is not called my strength or your strength, but God is called our strength. For we are strong, are we not, when we are one in Christ? We're strong when we are united in God's love, united by God's spirit, united by God's grace, united in our common faith. The Apostle Paul says, One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. There lies our strength. Even today, Jesus still commands us to make disciples. The Apostle Peter still calls us to use our gifts to build one another up. The Apostle Paul still wants us to speak the truth in love so that the whole church will grow up into maturity. So we need to keep on defending the teachings of the Bible. We need to keep on training and equipping the body of Christ, enabling and preparing the whole church, the whole body, in season and out of season, to be able to give a reason for the hope that we have in Christ to anyone who asks us. This is important because it is our God-given duty, our God-given duty to keep on calling people everywhere, men, women, boys and girls, Christians and non-Christians, to call people to repentance and faith in the Lord Jesus. Just like the psalmist is doing in our psalm today, might I say, in verse 3. Sound the ram's horn at the new moon and when the moon is full on the day of our feast, this is a decree for Israel, an ordinance of the God of Jacob. Do you see there? It is God's command that is being given here. God's ordinance, God's decree for Israel. God's command is being given. So don't give up on your church. Don't give up meeting together as some have done. Keep on singing, keep on serving because in your local church you will find people just like yourself who are on the same journey as you are with its ups and downs and valleys and mountains and hills. And in times of trouble they will be there for you to encourage you, to feed you, to comfort you, to pray with you and of course to weep and to rejoice with you through every season of life. God has given you a family in Christ to strengthen you and equip you and nurture you and help you. You need your church and your church needs you. In your local church you'll find the Holy Spirit is always at work in the lives of his people. And so even total strangers who walk in off the street will notice the difference when they come to a Christ-honouring, God-loving Bible teaching church. They will feel the presence of God's holiness in the midst of his people. They'll be drawn to the warmth of his fellowship in our lives and they will be attracted by the light of his word lived out by you and me. So never underestimate the power of the local church. For when we preach the gospel and when we declare the praises of our God, it's just like sounding the ram's horn or the shofar. That's the shofar, the, the Hebrew word for ram's horn. That's just like it's been sounded here in our passage. So the church must sound out the gospel loud and clear Sunday by Sunday or else we will fail to be a church at all. And now if, if our, our sound table is ready, I was so impressed by the sound of the ram's horn as I was checking it out this week. It's really electrifying. You have to listen to this. Uh, let's hear about a minute of it. Amazing sound. Oh, when I heard that, it sent shivers down my spine. I thought, that's incredible. 
That's the sound of the ram's horn, that ancient, ancient sound. And for me, it signifies the call of God. And God is saying to his people, come and worship. Come and assemble. Come and church with me. Verse 4 says, this is a decree for Israel, an ordinance for the God of Jacob. Come and church with the Lord. Come and be renewed in your faith through the preaching of his word, through the prayers of his people, through the singing of psalms, hymns and spiritual songs to the Lord. And let us never neglect our Christian duty to meet together to praise our God. Not even when we're feeling down. And of course we will feel down, don't we? When, when we look at our nation, we see the current path that it's on. It's very depressing. But even then, I find that I'm encouraged by this psalm because I'm convinced that I can hear a call for revival a recovery of lost joy. For who knows that, but that our God may use us in our own time and generation to turn many souls back to himself if we will only pray, if we will only turn and listen to the Lord and walk in his ways. It's getting smoky in here, isn't it? The bushfires must be blowing in our direction. I come to my second point for this morning. I've called it, that's why we praise him. Because our God is a God of saving grace. And I, and I can tell the psalmist is praying for revival in Israel. And I believe we must pray for revival in Australia. So let's keep on praying for a revival in our churches and in our land. There's a song of revival in the air and I can hear it in the words of Psalm 81. That's why we praise him. He is the God of salvation. He is the God of our strength. In verses 5 to 7, we have a summary of the gospel in Old Testament terms. Uh, let me hear it, read it to you again from verse 5. He established it as a statute for Joseph when he went out against Egypt, where we heard a language we did not understand. He says, I removed the burden from their shoulders. Their hands were set free from the basket. In your distress, you called and I rescued you. I answered you out of a thundercloud. I tested you at the waters of Meribah. Selah. That little word is an indication like an ancient underlining. Say, mark this point and mark it closely. So here we have some of the great examples of God's saving work in Israel's history. He saved them in the days of Joseph. That's verse 5. And he saved them in the days of Moses in verses 6 and 7. Because our God is a God who does what he promises. He always keeps his word. So, for example, in the case of Joseph, he answered the dreams that he gave to Joseph as a child. And in verse 5, he established it as a testimony for Joseph. It says statute there in verse 5, but I think the word testimony fits much better. He established it as a testimony or as a witness, an evidence to Joseph. And to us. You see, after years of grief, Joseph's father, Jacob, who became Israel, Jacob learnt that his son was not dead but is alive and is Lord in Egypt. And this this wonderful story of the recovery of lost joy, which is recorded in Genesis chapter 45, and I think our psalmist may have this little story in mind in verse 5. It's in Genesis chapter 45, verse 25. So if you've got your Bible, please turn there now. I'd like you to see as I read this passage uh, why I think this is the connection. Joseph has made himself known to his brothers and they've been reconciled. And you get to Genesis chapter 45 and I'm reading from verse 25. So they went up out of Egypt, the same form of words, and came to their father Jacob in the land of Canaan. They told him, Joseph is still alive. In fact, he is ruler of all Egypt. Jacob was stunned. He did not believe them. But when they told him everything Joseph had said to them and when he saw the carts Joseph had sent to carry him back, the spirit of their father Jacob revived and, notice his name changes, and Israel said, I'm convinced 
My son Joseph is still alive. I will go and see him before I die. You see, his heart has revived. It's like he's been given his life back again. God rescued Israel and God restored Israel's joy through Joseph. And I have to say, it makes my heart sing today. It's such a great story of salvation. It's the gospel according to Israel. And you know, if God can do that for Israel, then he can certainly do it for us. He can do amazing things that go far beyond what we could imagine. He can restore our broken relationships. He can even raise the dead as he raised Joseph, metaphorically speaking, and gave him back to his father, Israel. And so who knows what God may do for us as a church and as a nation in 2020 if we'll only turn to him and pray. So that's the connection with Joseph. And next in verses 6 and 7 we have more testimonies that come from the day of Moses. Here we see God's saving hand clearly in view in the events of the Exodus. And Again, these are testimonies that declare the praises of our God who saves his people. So in verse 6 God says, I removed the heavy burden of slavery from their shoulders. That's what he did in the Exodus, isn't it? Uh, Their hands were set free from the basket. Probably that's the basket they carried the bricks and the clay with. The, The signification of their enslavement to Pharaoh. In your distress you called and I rescued you. I answered you out of a thundercloud. That's probably Mount Sinai. I tested you at the waters of Meribah as they were journeying to the promised land. The word Meribah means quarrelling. Masa Meribah, testing and quarrelling. It's talking about the place in the desert where the Israelites quarrelled with Moses, causing him to lose his temper, where they tested the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? And Moses hit the rock three times with his staff and the water gushed out. But even as Israel tested the Lord, God was testing them. For he says here, I tested you at the waters of Meribah. I tested you. I found you wanting. Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Do not wear out the patience of our God. If you do, the results may be disastrous as they were for the generations of the Israelites who ended up perishing in the wilderness because God cursed them. He said in his anger, you shall never enter my rest and they didn't. They died outside the promised land. God raised up the second generation and led them in. So beware of complacency because complacency can lead to death. It's like the coal that gets taken out of the fire and all too soon the heat begins to drain from that little coal and the flame which once burned so brightly burns no more. Don't let that be you. That's why the psalmist is so troubled as he looks upon his church and his nation and he beholds the spiritual state of his people and he weeps. He's looking at them and he's asking the question, where's the love? I mean, where's the love from our side for God? God has loved us, but have we loved him? Where's the love? And this is where the lament part of our psalm really kicks in. This is my third point for today. I'm looking at verses 8 to 12. Now, God loved Israel. He loved them time and time and time again. The stories of Joseph, the stories of Moses clearly demonstrate that. It's beyond question. But Israel does not love God. And that's the truth, isn't it? So we look at these verses. Hear, O my people, and I will warn you. If you would but listen to me, O Israel. You shall have no foreign gods among you. You shall not bow down to an alien god. Isn't it good that we've done Deuteronomy recently? I am the Lord your God who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Open wide your mouth and I will fill it. Do you see? God is still willing to forgive his people if only they will listen to him. Open wide your mouth and I will fill it. 
What a wonderful picture. I'll give you the words to say. I'll give you the songs to sing. I will quench your thirst. I will satisfy your soul with good things. But if not, then I will teach you the hard way by my hard love. I will hand you over the desires of your hearts to enslave you and to leave you in even worse spiritual condition than you were before. This is God's hard love in verses 11 and 12. But my people would not listen to me. Israel would not submit to me. Remember, literally, they would have none of me. There's no love there in their hearts. And what is the consequence? Look for yourself at verse 12. God's handing over. God's giving them what they want. Oh, be careful when, you, when God gives you what you want. Much rather have what we need from God, not what we want. So I gave them over to their stubborn hearts to follow their own devices. This is a devastating word, isn't it? It stands as a serious warning to our own church and nation today. You see, there is such a thing as a national sin and disobedience, a kind of mindset that can sweep through an entire community. I think uh, Facebook and, and, and other kind of online systems encourage that when we have that echo chamber that we just listen to reinforcing views that lead us away from God. We've got to be so careful that we, we keep listening to God and testing what is happening and what we see happening around us. There is such thing as a national sin and disobedience. The leaders and the people can covenant together, as it were, to turn away from God and exchange the truth for a lie and that's what's happening in Australia. And that's why we need to pray for revival, isn't it? National sin and disobedience is the great and only thing that prevents national salvation and deliverance. Imagine a revival in our land a melting down of hearts by the hundreds and thousands, as has happened in history in the past. Imagine national leaders confessing Christ publicly, confessing their sins and their wrongs and turning the direction of our nation around and and beginning to proclaim and put in place laws that genuinely protect freedom, that genuinely protect freedom of conscience and faith, genuinely affirm and protect our community. God is calling us today to be salt and light in his world. The only way we can do that is if we ourselves are prepared to take him at his word, to stand up and be counted, come what may. So, my friends, it's time for us to fall in love again with the Lord. It's good to fall in love. That wonderful feeling of excitement and anticipation of seeing the face of your beloved again. To fall in love with the Lord more deeply, more truly, more passionately. And this is my final point for today. How do you fall in love again with the Lord? The answer could only be by knowing him. Not just knowing about him, but knowing him. Knowing him better. Knowing him as he is. Knowing him in his word, his character, his works and his glory. To behold the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is the image of God. You fall in love by knowing God in his glory. God's glory is his highest good, his supreme attribute, his most beautiful perfection. In the Old Testament, God's people were looking forward to the day when God would reveal his glory to them in a new way that they might fall in love with him more deeply and more truly. That's what the psalmist is singing about. Isaiah said, A voice cries in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up and every mountain and hill made low. The uneven ground shall become level and the rough places are plain and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Well, now that day has come. 
It dawned with the coming of our Lord Jesus, didn't it? The Apostle John says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And, verse 14 of chapter 1, we have seen his glory, the glory as of the one and only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. And so the disciples fell in love with Jesus. And so Christians down through the ages fall in love with God in Jesus Christ for we see his glory set out before us. The question for us I think today is just to test where you are in your love with God is would you be happy in heaven if Christ was not there? If you could have heaven with no sickness with all the friends you ever had on earth, with all the food you ever liked and all the leisure activities you ever enjoyed and all the natural beauties you ever saw and all the physical pleasures you ever tasted and there was no human conflict and no natural disasters, could you be satisfied with that life if Christ was not there? Because I think that's the heaven a lot of people are looking for, isn't it? They want a perfect world with no Christ. Well, your answer will tell you everything you need to know about your own heart. Do you truly love him? Where is your heart with God? You must realise that you cannot be truly happy without Jesus. Let's look at the last verses of our psalm. If my people would but listen to me, If Israel would follow my ways, how quickly would I subdue their enemies and turn my hand against their foes? Those who hate the Lord would cringe before him and their punishment would last forever. But you would be fed with the finest of wheat, with honey from the rock. I would satisfy you. Oh Israel, do you love me? O church, do you love him? Jesus once said, if the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as your own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That's why the world hates you. Remember the words I spoke to you, no servant is greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. But if they obey my teaching, they will obey yours also. If Christ is your saviour, then you are safe indeed. If God is your strength, then you are strong indeed. Today we're living in a time of national sin and disobedience, aren't we? And with the psalmist, we look around us, we feel grieved by the abject spiritual poverty of church and nation. Oh, Lord, wake us up. Renew our love for you. Help us to delight in you again. So we must not be discouraged by today's psalm or by the situations we see around us. Rather, Psalm 81 encourages us to take courage in the midst of these difficult times. Who knows, they may get even worse yet. Nevertheless, let us take our courage from God's word. Let us take our confidence from the Holy Spirit who is with us and let us take our comfort from the words of God's King, the Lord Jesus, knowing that he is the great joy restorer of his people. So remember Joseph and the joy he brought when Israel met him again. Remember Moses and the joy of the promises of God and seeing God's glory and hearing God's name proclaimed. And remember the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ who conquered the grave and gives us the hope of eternal life. In closing, what are some impossible applications of today's passage? What could you not possibly conclude today having heard what we've heard? Let me give you three suggestions of impossible applications. First of all, it ought to be impossible to think after reading God's word today that God will not judge us for our sins. 
That should be impossible. Of course he will. If God didn't judge us for our sins, frankly, I don't think I'd want to worship him at all. God's holy indignation is a necessary good. It actually proves that he cares about injustice. I need to know that my God is of that character. It is impossible to think that God won't judge us for our sins. Secondly, it should be impossible to think that God isn't incredibly patient with us. Isn't God patient? He puts up with our ingratitude and he extends the hand of grace time and time and time again. It should be impossible to think that God is not incredibly incredibly patient with us. Let me get that right. Too many negatives in there, isn't it? God is incredibly patient with us. I think thirdly, it should be impossible not to feel grief and sadness as we look at our world today. The collapse of moral standards in Australia is actually a sure sign that God's wrath is increasing on our nation and I think we're in the smoke of it now. God is warning us to wake up. We should be praying for God's mercy. We should be praying for a season of revival right now because our world is in a mess and people need the Lord. They need him now more than ever. Well, let us pray. Our gracious and loving Heavenly Father, again we confess to you our lovelessness and we pray that in your mercy you would restore our first love for you. Show us your glory. Show us the glory of the risen Lord Jesus Christ, the spotless lamb whose blood was poured out for the sins of the world. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for the word of warning that you set before us today. And in response to it, we pray for a season of revival in our land. O Lord, turn the hearts of your people and even those who are lost. May they be found and come to know Christ as Lord. May many hearts be changed and melted down. May knees bend and bow before the cross, before the throne of Jesus. And May many eyes be lifted up to behold the King of kings and Lord of lords in whom we place our hope today. Lord, you are the great joy restorer of your people. And so today we sing for joy in God our strength and we shout aloud to the God of Jacob until Christ comes again. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.